Chapter 6 The pressurized cabin whooshed and bled air. Ellis waited until the large LED above the door glowed red, and then opened it. The roaring wind and rain immediately greeted him. Ellis stepped out of the command center, closed the door behind him, and walked to the ER doors by the tunnel. The HPD patrol car had pulled far beyond the facade. There wasn't enough room for another vehicle beneath the overhang. Ellis watched two cops get out of their car, both men wearing heavy yellow rain slickers. The wind tore at the coats, the ends flapping in the wind. One of the cops looked like an overripe lemon, his waist bulging out of the coat. The other was thin as a rail. Laurel and Hardy? They sent us Laurel and Hardy? He smirked and managed to stifle a gale of laughter. By the time they were beneath the overhang, the slickers were soaked and the cops looked a little more than pissed off. Ellis inwardly groaned. This was just the kind of night he'd wanted. I'm Dr. Ellis with the CDC, he said. The two cops looked at one another and then back to him. I'm Pendleton, the heavyset one said. This is Fletcher. What's the situation? Nice to meet you, Ellis gestured at the doors. We need to make sure no one goes in or out unless they're HPD or federal employees. Pendleton stared at the quarantine tunnel. Shit, they told us to get here as quick as we could. Didn't tell us why. Ellis sighed. We have a quarantine underway inside the ER. That tunnel is the only way to get into the hot zone. We need one of you to make sure no one messes with the tunnel and the other to guard the entrance. Quarantine, Fletcher said. The thin man's face had already paled. You have suits for us? For a moment, Ellis didn't understand the question. He paused and then shook his head. We wear the suits, he told the cop. You're just here to make sure no one gets in that's not supposed to, and no one leaves without ID. Pendleton nodded. Okay, we got it, Doc. Everyone else inside? We have six CDC personnel, including myself, Ellis said. There are still a number of doctors and nurses in the ER, and the trauma center has two surgeries ongoing. So you're the doorman? Fletcher asked. Funny. Ellis glared at the cop and then jerked a thumb to the command center. I'm manning the communications network and the video feeds in there. Good, Pendleton said. I assume that means you'll know if something goes wrong before we do. Probably, Ellis agreed but the only thing we should have to worry about is someone trying to get in that isn't supposed to, or a patient freaking out and trying to leave. So one of you inside the double doors, the other guarding the tunnel. That should be all you need to do. The two cops looked at one another, and then at the tunnel. Something unspoken passed between them. Fletcher walked past Ellis and inside the doors. We got it, Doc. If I need you, I could just bang on the RV. Right, Ellis said. Sorry for the cold. Pendleton pulled a wrapped cigar from the pocket of his slicker. I don't mind. At least I can smoke a stogie. Ellis laughed and turned back to the command center. A vicious gust of wind blasted the overhang, and he actually felt his hair standing up. The world flashed for a moment, and then three seconds later, the sky exploded with sound. The thunder vibrated his skin. He got back in the command center, pressurized the cabin and sat back in the comms chair. He glanced up at the monitors just in time to see Mathis leaving the room. Where the hell are you going? Ellis said aloud. Webb, Hurtado, V, and Jennifer were all crowded around a microscope. The fact he didn't have audio was more than a little maddening, but he could fix that. He hit a button on the console and opened up the speakers to the audio stream. In addition to the video cameras Hurtado and Webb had placed around the room, each of the CDC suits had mics to record interactions. After Liberia, it was common practice. If one or all of the team became infected or died, home base would have a full record of what happened. The speakers hummed with communal breathing. Ellis listened distractedly, and then his eyes swung back to the monitors. Suddenly, he was very interested in what they were saying. Chapter 7 Bullshit is what Matt Hurtado was thinking. The microscope had to be defective. Either that or they'd all been subjected to hallucinogenics. In a way, Matt wished it was the latter. The test tube holding the swab was stained with black. He'd put the test tube in one of the metal holders next to the microscope. 
He didn't want to open the stopper, and he didn't want to know what the fluid was. The cotton swab end looked burned, and the cotton itself seemed to have departed this plane of existence. As if that wasn't strange enough, Webb had asked him to take a look through the microscope, and that's what he was blinking at. Webb was looking at him, presumably waiting for him to say something. Matt tried to put everything he felt into words. Bullshit. A grin touched Webb's normally humorless face. I'm fairly certain that's not a scientific term. Matt glared at him. Do you know what I see? He pointed at the microscope. I see massive deformity in the blood cells. I see vacuolus. I see something that seems to be tearing them apart. They've lost their shape and started to, I don't know, coagulate. Matt shook his head. Bullshit. She'd have been dead hours ago. Webb nodded. Exactly. And what about those black flecks? Black flecks. So that's what he's calling those things? Something had to be wrong with the machine, damn it. Or the slide. Something. The blood cells were so deformed they might as well be protozoa, and they had started to stack on top of one another, thickening. The aptly named flex spun around the edges of the cells like microscopic gnats. Never read of anything like that. Sure as hell never seen anything like it. Webb's face had gone a little pale. Have you? Webb paused for a moment. No. He looked over at Veronica, who stood next to Webb, arms crossed in front of her. V? Matt asked. Veronica stared off into space. When she didn't respond to his question, he asked again. Her eyes didn't deviate from the wall, but she slowly shook her head. No one has, she said. Great, even our blood expert says this is impossible. Matt tapped his gloved hand on the table. I'm guessing we need the SEM for this? V looked at him, the corners of her mouth twitching into a dim smile. Yeah, I think that's what we need to. She swung her head toward Marie's bed as the EKG went into a flat tone. Matt whirled and stared at the dying woman. Marie's body twitched slightly and then lay still. The EKG returned to a slow, thready beep. She's going to die, Matt whispered. V nodded. Yeah, she is. She turned and picked up the test tube containing the blood sample. But maybe we can keep the other three alive. If we can figure out what this shit is. She walked to the door and disappeared into the tunnel. Matt watched her go, wishing he was with her. He turned back to Webb and the microscope. What do you want to do with that sample? Set it on fire, Webb said. I'm going to be seeing this shit in my nightmares. What we just looked at isn't really possible. Webb put his eyes back to the microscope lens. He peered for a moment and then pushed back his chair. He slowly raised a shaking finger. What is it? Webb didn't say anything. Matt leaned toward the microscope and then stopped. He didn't need to look through the lens to know what Webb had seen. The blood on the slide was completely black now, and it seemed to be moving. Chapter 8 V radioed him as soon as she headed to the ER entrance. Ellis donned his helmet, made sure the pressure levels were good, and walked out of the command center. A large plastic case dangled from his arm. The bright red biohazard decals practically glowing in the light from the overheads. The HPD cop smoked a cigar at the tunnel's side. In his pressurized suit, Ellis smelled nothing. The cop, Pendleton if he remembered correctly, took the cigar from his clamped jaws and held it expertly between two fingers. What you got there, Doc? Ellis waited until he was close enough for the man to hear him through the helmet. Simple case. Ellis pointed to the tunnel. I'm bringing back a sample from the quarantine area. If you don't want to be quarantined yourself, please step through the doors far past the tunnel entrance. The cop blinked, but said nothing. He removed something shiny from his pocket and put it over the cigar. A few sparks flew from behind the cone-shaped piece of metal. After shaking it twice, he put the metal back in his pocket and placed the snuffed-out cigar into his jacket. Thank you, Ellis said. The cop nodded and walked through the doors until he was past both sets. Ellis, where the hell are you? V's voice crackled in his headset. Be right there, V. 
The sample case swung a little as he moved into the tunnel. V waited at its rear, the brightly lit ER triage room just beyond, a test tube jutting from her fisted right glove. See? He unlatched the case. The airtight gaskets grudgingly released and it opened. Ellis took the test tube from Veronica, placed it in the case's holder, quickly closed the lid, and relocked it. Okay, he said, we're done. We need to get a shot of it from the SEM. Our patient is dying, Ellis said in a monotone. Veronica opened her mouth and then closed it. She gave a slight nod, her face dropping into an expressionless line. Let's see if we can keep the other three alive. Understood. Ellis turned and quickly made his way through the tunnel. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the two cops standing beside it. Hopefully, they knew well enough to stay away from him until he reached the command center. As soon as he left the tunnel, a gust of wind hit him and pulled at the rectangular case in his hand. Ellis put his head down and forced his way to the command center. He touched the outer button and the doors opened. Once inside, he pressurized the cabin and placed the case on the long counter filled with instruments. He nearly took off his helmet before remembering he had a pathogen in the vehicle. Sighing, he threw away his coffee, emptied the coffee machine, put a biohazard sticker on it, and placed it in a cabinet. Ellis turned back to the case. The test tube was almost completely black. Almost, but not quite. Small blobs of strange red color swirled inside. He hit the button for the strong overheads, and a sudden burst of light chased away the shadows in the cabin. With a deep breath, he unlatched the case and began preparing a slide of the blood. The portable scanning electron microscope, or SEM, was actually large. It crowded the back of the command center, leaving just enough space for a person to stand in front of it. The power consumption was considerable, but that's why the command center wasn't a normal RV. As long as he didn't do too many runs, the command center would be fine. He thumbed the radio on his suit and stared at the too dark test tube. Veronica? Yeah, Alice? She sounded almost bored, and he knew what that meant. She'd already given up on saving Krieger. It was her own special defense mechanism. Whenever the shit got bad, she just seemed to shut off any and all empathy. She became a robot. It didn't make Ellis feel any better. Any idea what's going on in there? This blood looks, well, looks wrong. Normally, she would have said something like, duh. Instead, all he got was, uh, yes, it's too dark. Ellis grimaced. I'm getting thready readings on Krieger, but the rest seem fine. We sure they're even infected? Jennifer's voice broke into the line. We don't know anything right now, she said. All we know is we have to try and stabilize her. Now do us a favor and find out what's killing her. There was no contempt in the voice, but he detected impatience. Yes, doctor. Call us as soon as you know something, Jennifer said. Ellis didn't bother replying. He rolled his chair to the SEM reached the cabinet next to the station and brought out the fluids he'd need to fix the slide. Preparing blood for an SEM image wasn't trivial. If the measurements were off, the image would distort and give false readings. Ellis had done it long enough to have the process down, and it had been years since he'd mangled a sample. In a tiny beaker, he mixed 0.07 m of sodium cacodylate and 1.5% grudoaldehyde. Ellis swirled the beaker slightly the liquid barely covering the bottom. They were on a clock, and he didn't think they had a chance of figuring out what was killing the patient before she actually died. Not if the goddamn fixative took an hour to set. He glanced at the normal microscope on the counter. The other team members had already analyzed the sample using conventional methods, and if they hadn't found anything, he wouldn't either. With the fixative ready, he reached to pick up the test tube and stopped. A bubble rose in the blood and popped. Ellis frowned. This has to be contaminated, he thought. His mind immediately burned through a possible list of problems with the needle and syringe that could make blood, well, carbonate like that. Nothing came to mind. He'd never even heard of blood doing that. Ellis to Harold, go. He licked his lips. He didn't know why, but he suddenly felt claustrophobic. Is this blood? Pause. We honestly don't. The sound of voices arguing came through the mic. 
Ellis glanced up at the monitors. The other three patients' vitals bumped up and down in regular patterns. Marie Krieger, patient zero, had flatlined. Fuck, Ellis breathed. Forgetting about the test tube, he rolled back to his station and checked the recordings. All the data was streaming as normal. He watched his boss run out of the room as Webb, Veronica, and Hurtado crowded around the dead patient. Come on, he heard Hurtado whispering through his mic. Ellis shook his head, fists clenched. They had to do something. There had to be something they could do to keep her alive. Hurtado raised the paddles to restart Krieger's heart. Ellis said a silent prayer. Eyes riveted on the screens. He didn't notice the bubbles rising in the test tube behind him.